In this segment of Einstein on Diabetes, we're talking with Dr. Jeffrey Pesson about research at Einstein and Montefiore about both the treatment and prevention of diabetes. Regarding research at Einstein, tell me about the main research that you're doing and the most exciting research that you're doing. Well, we have a lot of different areas of research. The Diabetes Research Center at Einstein is a very comprehensive diabetes type center. So we do all aspects of diabetes research from, as we mentioned, global health to community-based uh, programs to actual basic molecular research and preclinical and, and um, cell models in, in the wet batch laboratories. I think some of the most exciting things that are going on is, is the discoveries at Einstein that actually your brain actually controls a lot of what goes on in your metabolism. Your brain seems to control how much your liver produces glucose and how much glucose it uses. It also has a major impact on how your other tissues work, including how much insulin your beta cells secrete, how much glucose is taken up by your muscle and your adipose tissue. So understanding how your brain coordinates all these different tissues and how it helps maintain your glucose homeostasis is critically important because also the brain controls how much food you eat, what makes you hungry. It's not your stomach that makes you hungry, it's, your, it's how your brain perceives how hungry you should be. And so all of this is integrated and it's integrated through a special part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And people in Einstein, there's a large group of us who are working and trying to understand these regulatory mechanisms through what we call the central nervous system, which is the brain and to understand how that's really controlling metabolism, our energy expenditure, our activity, and our food intake. Now is that research unique to Einstein or many other diabetes research centers doing the same kind of research? Now there are several other centers and individuals who are doing this kind of research, uh, but it was all initiated here. And I think we've made some of the most uh, promising discoveries in this, but there are many other groups now who followed suit because of the importance of this area of study. Now the brain will also say, I'm hungry, so you eat. Will it also regulate your desire to exercise and burn calories? Well, it can, but what happens in most overweight individuals is that it tells you not to. It slows you down and it tells you eat more and exercise less. And trying to reverse that is one of the major goals that we're trying to understand. Once we understand those neural pathways and the neural hormones that control that, we'll have ways of intervening. And we've actually made some progress on that. And we have several young and new investigators who have made some important inroads and are thinking about doing our clinical trials. Let's expand now on, the, on type 1 diabetes. What are you doing specifically with research in that area with the focus on autoimmune disease and attacking that part of the, of the issue? Right. So there are several different aspects of type 1 diabetes. At Einstein here, we have actually two main themes that we're going after. One is to prevent the autoimmunity. And that will prevent then the destruction of the beta cells and will block type 1 diabetes. That is not good for those people who already have full-blown type 1 diabetes because the autoimmune systems have already destroyed the beta cells. These are beta cells in the pancreas? In the pancreas, correct, that make insulin and secrete insulin in response to glucose. Um, so uh, a group of investigators have tried to look at the autoantigens and to ask questions, how do we prevent those antigens from activating the immune response? And uh, Dr. Th uh, Teresa DiLorenzo has made uh, important strides in understanding what this is. There's something in immunity called tolerance. So for example, why don't we destroy our own tissues? Why don't we make antibodies to our own liver and destroy our own liver? We don't because our immune system knows that belongs to us. But if I took your liver and put it into me, my antibodies would attack that liver and try to get rid of it, unless you use immunosuppressants, which is what they do in transplants. So Teresa has worked out uh, an understanding of what makes your beta cell unique to you and different from somebody else's. And by doing that, she has devised a method to block that autoimmunity and to create what we call that tolerance. So now your cells will start to think that the beta cell from somebody else is really yours, right? Now, if you could do that in a person that has autoimmune diabetes, you would then change that beta cell from being an antigen, which means it's being attacked by your own antibodies, to one that says, no, that's not, that's self, I really shouldn't be attacking that. And so she's actually made a lot of progress in that, and she can actually do this now in mice. The question is, can we translate this now to humans? So the bottom line is to protect the destruction of the pancreatic beta cells so that they can continue to produce insulin and prevent diabetes. Correct, absolutely correct. 
Right. Now, the other aspect that we're doing, uh, we're working on, is uh, studies by several investigators, including Rubina Heptula in pediatrics. And what she's doing is looking at uh, developing uh, what we would call an artificial pancreas, so to speak. That is, we know that type 1 diabetics take insulin, and uh, a lot of type 1 diabetics go on what's called the insulin pump. Uh, instead of injecting themselves with insulin all the time, they have a mechanical device, it's very small, it attaches, they usually wear that on their belt or some kind of pocket, they carry it around with them, and it slowly infuses insulin, and you can adjust it through remote control or through various electronic ways of the amount of insulin that it's, it's, it's giving you. Now, the problem is, is that it has to be manually adjusted. If you can combine that with a glucose sensor that can measure your, your glucose in your, in your blood, in your body, then that can feed directly to the pump and tell the pump how much insulin to give you. That's sort of what we would call a closed loop system. That is, it senses the glucose that you have, it tells the pump how much insulin to give, if you need more insulin, it says more, if it needs less insulin, it says less. And so that is what we would call an artificial pancreas. And she's working on developing those. And there's a lot of engineering and technical issues with doing something like that. But again, progress is being made, and we're hopeful within the next decade or so that a closed loop artificial quote pancreas or beta cell will be available. So that has nothing to do with the cure of the disease, no. the maintenance of the disease. That's a treatment. This is a treatment, not a cure. So I want to go back to the autoimmune research that you're doing. That has potential to cure the disease or to halt the spread of disease. If an individual is diagnosed early, it would prevent the disease. But once you have full-blown type 1 diabetes, it's probably too late because the autoimmunity won't help you, unless you couple it with a trans, for example, a transplant. So if you had a transplant and then you could block the autoimmunity, that could work. Or using uh, uh, genetic tools and stem cell uh, uh, therapy to regenerate beta cells then you could use the autoimmunity to prevent the further rejection. What are we doing in the area of stem cell research or stem cell therapies in this area? Are you also working on that? We are working a little bit on that, but we don't have as much as a, of, a, of a push to do that. And the reason is basically because if you can't block the autoimmunity, stem cell therapy to regenerate your own beta cells will not work because the autoimmunity will get reactivated, attack them, and destroy them again. So in order for a stem cell program to actually work, you have to understand how to control the autoimmunity first. And, and so that's been our philosophy and that's what we've been working on. Do you think the work that you're doing in the autoimmune area mm -hmm. has the potential for that population we're talking about, the early juvenile population, to actually cure the disease? Well, that cure, prevent. 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 I wouldn't use it because a cure implies that you already have a disease and you reverse it. This will prevent it from occurring. It won't necessarily reverse the disease. Could it? In the future? Could, could, it, could it slow it or reverse it? It's potentially possible, but we don't know enough about beta cell regeneration to know. There is some data in the literature that if, it's young, if you're young enough, your beta cells still can replicate. However, once you get above the age of about eight or so, your ability to replicate is probably gone. And so it would potentially could work if you're very, very young. Jeff, let's talk about another disease category called prediabetes. I understand that you have some research that looks at preventing these people from moving from a pre-diabetic position to a diabetic condition. So could you describe that a little bit? Yeah, so in prediabetes, what happens is, is that you're, unlike these other forms, your beta cells are fine. They're secreting plenty of insulin and they're responding appropriately. What happens though is that your peripheral tissue, and when I say peripheral tissue, I mean things like your liver and your muscle, they're not responding to the insulin very well. So your body has to make extra insulin to kind of compensate because the amount that's normally produced isn't sufficient to work. So you have to make more. But there's nothing intrinsically wrong with your insulin secretion. So the question is why are these other tissues not responding to the insulin like they normally would? And there are a variety of reasons for that, and a lot of faculty at Einstein are trying to figure out what, what those mechanisms are. If we could block those mechanisms, then you'd become more insulin sensitive again. The insulin would work normally, and your beta cells would have to produce less insulin, and that would protect your beta cells from any kind of future dysfunction. Okay, if you're in that pre-diabetic state, is it, I mean, obviously lifestyle changes, diet mm -hmm. and exercise, right. that will make a difference, but yes. in some cases it may take medications. Correct. So typically, 
for diseases like that, you give, uh, a specific drug is given called metformin. And metformin has the property of increasing lipid metabolism in the liver. And so that gets rid of the bad lipid that's present and will make the liver more insulin sensitive. And metformin is a very safe drug. It's been, been used for about 70 years now. Uh, and it's a very safe and very effective drug, one of the most effective drugs we have. How do you determine on an individual basis who should do the behavioral changes and who should get the medication? Everybody should do the behavioral changes. There's absolutely no question. The problem is, is that how many actually do it and how many is it effective in? But everybody should take the behavioral changes. That means exercising and if you can't run, you should walk 30 minutes a day. You should eat healthier foods, stay away from fats and sugars, tend to eat more vegetables and fruits, uh, and, and high fiber foods. These are all beneficial things, and everybody, whether you're a diabetic or non-diabetic, should be doing that. Then who takes metformin? Those people who cannot be controlled by lifestyle intervention. If that, and what percentage is that, would you say? Uh, it's probably the vast majority of diabetics or pre-diabetics. Jeff, let me ask you um, about whether or not diabetes, type 2 diabetes, can be reversed. Because many people who are in the pre-diabetic state worry about developing diabetes, but if they do, they would like to know if they do the right things, take the right medications, uh, engage in the right behavior, they can reverse it. Is that possible? Yes. For type 2 diabetes, it is possible in the early stages, not, usually not in the late stages. You have to understand sort of the etiology, the development of type 2 diabetes. It starts out because some of your tissues like muscle, liver, and your adipose tissue are not that responsive to the insulin. And so your beta cells of the pancreas, the cells that secrete the insulin, secrete more to make up for their uh, insensitivity to the normal amount of insulin. So your beta cells make extra insulin, and that brings your glucose back down again. But it's really producing more insulin than it normally should. Typically, that's what you would call a pre-diabetic. Now what happens is, is that with time, the beta cells kind of give up. They can't keep making enough insulin because the resistance of the muscle and the liver and other tissues gets worse and worse and worse with time. Eventually the pancreas says, I can't do this anymore. I'm stopping. And it stops making insulin. And that's when you become what we call a frank type 2 diabetic because now you have very little insulin secretion and you got to take insulin now, even as a type 2. But your beta cells, although they're not producing any insulin, they're still there. And they can recover if you get the resistance down. So if the muscle and the liver start recovering and behaving better, then the pancreas has a chance to rest, so to speak, and can make more insulin, and then can start secreting again. So you have to do this early enough, within a few years of being a type 2 diabetic or in your pre-diabetic state. So if you take your medications, and you change your environment, your, your, your weight, you lose weight, you exercise, you can now make your peripheral tissue, your muscle and your liver, more insulin sensitive. It gives your pancreas a chance to recover and you can actually get away with becoming normal again. Let's talk about some other research areas. I understand one of your research is looking at um, uh, a chemical or drug that would increase fat burning in right. our bodies right. and therefore prevent obesity. Is that a major research area of yours? Yes, yes. So one of the things our lab, we, our lab works on a variety of different things, but one of the things that we've been doing is working on a class of drugs which can increase fatty acid oxidation, not just in the liver, but also in muscle. Uh, it turns out that using lipid fatty acids as an energy source primarily occurs in your skeletal muscle. And since your skeletal muscles, your largest mass of your body, you have more skeletal muscle than anything else in your body. If you can increase just a little bit the utilization of the fatty acids, the lipids in your body, you would really drive those levels down if you can increase it just a little bit in skeletal muscle. So we have a big program trying to figure out and understand some of those mechanisms. Uh, we've made some very important inroads and we have some small molecules that we're testing right now. And some of them seem to have at least positive therapeutic actions, at least in in preclinical models. They haven't been tested in humans yet. Are our medications getting better? Because we're not, we're not exercising as much. When you get told to exercise, we don't do it. Um, so are, is it fair to say that based on, on research at Einstein and other places, the medications have gotten better and are helping uh, to attack this disease? Yeah, there's no question that, that the new generations like exenatide and these, what, what we call DPP-4 inhibitors, this other class of drugs, 
they, they are much more effective than, than the other drugs that were previously used to treat diabetics. However, you're trying to treat uh, a disease which is environmentally uh, induced by a medication. And so it's not going to be as good as changing lifestyles. The problem is how to correct that lifestyle. It may not be possible in our society to do that anymore. We may have to go back to being a gatherer and a hunter, which is not going to happen. So uh, we have to develop other, other ways of, of doing this. And medication is one. It's a poor substitute, but it may be the only choice we have. In our next segment of Einstein On, we're going to look at future trends in diabetes and how to curb the development of the disease, both in the U.S. and around the world.